Hola, mi nombre es Ibe y estoy aquí, soy una estudiante en el, en el Departamento de Telemedicina, en Arizona, y estoy aquí con el doctor Weinstein y él está muy agradecido por esta gran oportunidad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, greetings. It's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to address your Congress. Uh, I thank uh, my good friend uh, Peko uh, LaRocca for the uh, invitation. Sorry that we've had a little bit of problems in communication as to exactly when this presentation would take place, but uh, I'm glad to be able to uh, forward a DVD that contains the uh, major content for the uh, presentation. Okay, I'd like to uh, spend about uh, 30 minutes covering some aspects of the uh, history of telemedicine that I think have critically important take-home lessons, and then uh, bring you up to date on current thinking about the major applications of telemedicine as we see it in the United States. So basically, as you know, being, especially being at a telemedicine conference, uh, telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare at a distance. Uh, this uh, slide gives my uh, title, which is Telemedicine and Telehealth Overview of and a 50-Year Update. And uh, the 50-Year Update comes from the fact that I've actually been in the telemedicine field for about 50 years. I think there are probably a half a dozen people in the world who actually have been doing telemedicine since its very origins in the 1960s. And uh, I was a by, uh, by chance observer of telemedicine very, very early in my career and have had the uh, opportunity to follow the evolution of the field ever since. So a 50 year update. Uh, I really wanna focus on lessons learned from the telemedicine experience in Arizona, since I think there are take home lessons that are of general value. Now, Arizona is a very, very uh, large state. It's the sixth largest state in the United States. Uh, Arizona is actually larger than uh, all of the New England states put together. And uh, so Arizona has always been a natural site for the development of telemedicine. And, and in fact, has also played uh, a significant uh, role in the development of telemedicine in other countries as a testbed and so forth. This was a delegation that came up from Panama and uh, to actually test some broadband radio equipment that eventually was deployed into Panama as the first uh, part of a national program. Take a look at the picture and see if you can identify somebody from Panama who's of great importance. And uh, over here in the circle, we have my dear friend, Dr. Sylvia Vega. And uh, Dr. Vega actually uh, was critical to the formation of the initial program in Panama and uh, remains a leader today. And of course, is, is a past uh, president of uh, Adelaide. So I send my greetings to Dr. Vega. Uh, the Arizona Telemedicine Program has been involved in many international programs over the years. Uh, programs from uh, Peru and Brazil as part of an Amazon River Marathon swim, which set a record for uh, swimming the length of the Amazon, but that, that was supported by telemedicine beginning to end. Uh, our work in uh, Panama, our work in the Balkans under Dr. Latifi, our work in Mexico, particularly for telepathology, uh, our work in uh, China, our work in India. So we've, we've had various involvements in, in many locations. And in each case, we learn as much as we teach as we go into these uh, activities. Uh, the most recent involvement has through, been through the International um, Virtual Hospital, uh, for which I sit on the, as vice chair of their board, and it's in Cape Verde, and uh, there are uh, nine islands in Cape Verde, about a half a million people that are telemedicine equipped, and it's quite a success story in terms of upgrading an entire healthcare system utilizing telemedicine. So each of these, each of these activities are uh, both interesting and instructive. Our activities in Panama began in uh, two th uh, the, the year 2000, 2001, when we were invited by the United States government to uh, give assistance to Panama to develop a, a demonstration project that's uh, still very existent and very, very successful. And of course, this gives us the great opportunity to go out and make new friends uh, in rural areas and in a number of countries like Panama, particularly Panama. 
Well, that's uh, we're talking about rural. We're talking about bringing bringing uh, t medical care to underserved populations. But ironically, that's not the way telemedicine started. Telemedicine started um, with two remarkable aspects. First of all, it was very much an urban project, not a rural project. And second of all, telemedicine was born intact. The original telemedicine programs, uh, program in, 19, in the 1960s, actually involved most of the applications, many of the applications that are center stage today, including te telepulmonology, telecardiology, uh, even the early vestiges of uh, telepathology, certainly psychiatry and radiology. And uh, the circumstance for actually creating the initial uh, program is very interesting. There was a plane crash out at Logan International Airport in Boston in 1961. And uh, the city fathers asked the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, then the largest uh, or highest prestige teaching hospital in the United States, to give them a hand in figuring out how they could bring services out to the uh, airport. And for those of you who've been in Boston, there are very serious uh, travel constraints in Boston. And at that time, there was a single tunnel that connected uh, uh, the main part of Boston uh, to the area out of the airport. So although the, the distance between the hospital and the airport as the bird flies was about four miles, it often took uh, 45 minutes or an hour to get out to the airport. So that was the challenge that was uh, that was undertaken uh, at the time in Boston to try to bring services out to the Logan International Airport. And here we can see a picture showing the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in the lower right-hand corner and the arrow pointing out toward Logan Airport. Dr. Kenneth Bird, who was the uh, leader of the project, was actually a pulmonologist who I knew when I was a pathology resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, he was a great uh, salesman as well as uh, a very clever statesman. And he actually put the original program together with the strong support of the senior leadership at Harvard and the Massachusetts General Hospital. So this is a picture of Dr. Bird. Um, he certainly is credited with, with envisioning multi-specialty telemedicine, uh, but he also uh, was the example of a champion for a number of years. This is the, uh, the actual site of the uh, first telemedicine clinic, which was out at Logan Airport, out at Gate 23. And it was a remarkable television studio that aggregated a number of very, very advanced technologies into a system that worked from day number one. And over the years, over 2,000 walk-in patients got telemedicine services out at the Logan International Airport. This is what a nurse looked like back then when uh, I was a resident. Notice the outfit. Uh, I've carefully avoided putting in a picture of myself at that time, but uh, had the male counterpart outfit. Uh, but she's aiming the uh, portable camera at the patient and uh, taking uh, pictures for a dermatology study. And, and uh, she actually ran the clinic at that time with uh, great success. Uh, this is Bird, Dr. Bird uh, doing his thing. And uh, notice in the upper uh, upper right-hand corner, very sophisticated electron equipment for its time. Looks like the inside of a space capsule. Now, this program became very well known. It was front page uh, news in many uh, uh, magazines and newspapers. You can see the TV guide in the upper left-hand corner. At that time, our famous comedian, uh, Bob Hope, had just reached his uh, 65th birthday. They were celebrating it in the same issue. And of course, he died at 103 some years ago. So it gives you a sense of how long, just how long ago this was. But anyway, word spread around the world. And, and in time, there were over 100 telemedicine programs scattered over the face of the earth uh, by the late 1970s. But by 1980s, the entire world went black. And there were only a couple of telemedicine programs that actually survived in the 1980s. So what's interesting is that technology was not the limitation and quality of services was never the limitation. But telemedicine simply didn't fit into the healthcare systems that it was asked to support. The next step that uh, occurred uh, a couple of years after the beginning of the uh, program at the Mass General, and what happened was that the uh, the federal government realized that uh, there was a gold mine in terms of publicity. 
that you could get from a telemedicine program. And NASA, our National Space Agency, decided to clone the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, experience and do telemedicine on a broader scale. And they decided to do it on an Indian reservation. There were uh, six Indian reservations from around the United States that competed for what was a very, very lucrative contract. Uh, in 1972, our federal government spent $6 million for each of three years. That would be 30 to $50 million a year today. So money was poured in to try to show terrestrial applications of telemedicine, because a lot of these technologies had also been deployed in space capsules. And, uh, but that was very important to the federal government. So they put out, they put out a request for a proposal and what is now the to Odom uh, Reservation, just, just south of Tucson, was the, uh, what, uh, won the contract. I might say, in relationship to uh, some of the projects that you have going in Central America and South America, very, very relevant because at that time, the Indian Reservation had great uh, concerns about accepting a project without long-term guarantees by the U.S. federal government. And, and this issue was actually raised when we were invited to come and give technical assistance in Panama because the senior leadership of the University of, uh, of Panama was very, very concerned whether whatever we might bring in might be very time limited. And it turned out to be a very significant problem. But anyway, the, the next point is that the technology as it existed in the 1960s and 1970s was very sophisticated, very successful, and very well published. And you can go back and read papers from that era and we'll be amazed at uh, how modern they sound. So StarPAC involved uh, bringing in a tertiary care hospital, primary care hospitals, bringing in community health centers, which were very novel at that time, bringing in mobile vans uh, to do telemedicine linked by linked by point to point microwave. It involved uh, putting uh, microwave towers on the top of uh, mountains for which they had to clip off the top of the mountains, excavate them in order to make the space. So this was an extremely elaborate project. One of the reasons why it actually came to Arizona was at that time, the hospital where I worked, University Medical Center, was developing the first electronic patient health record in the country. And they were very interested in having an organization they could partner with in order to develop an electronic health care record. And here, 40 years later, we're still working on that project. Uh, so the project was called StarPAC. It involved uh, NASA, as you can see there, uh, Indian Health Service, uh, Lockheed Missile uh, Systems Company, and then what was at that time called the Papago uh, Indian Tribe. So here we can see the inside of one of these mobile vans developing the electronic health record. Uh, we can see a pioneering work done on mobile clinics, which turned out to be uh, very, very effective from a healthcare perspective, bringing healthcare out to the uh, Indians, and uh, also uh, a lot of work, uh, initial work on telecardiology was actually done as part of this project, and, and including taking these stethoscopes that had been developed for our space capsules for our astronauts into a terrestrial application for the first time. Well, the project lasted three years. The federal government decided not to continue to fund it. Uh, there was a significant disruption of uh, workflow and a patient healthcare uh, system. And, uh, and the project vanished, despite its great successes. Uh, here we are 40 years later, actually recognizing the people who were involved in the original project, and heard, including the original um, uh, engineer, local engineer, Peter Ruiz, uh, some 40 years later now, a remarkable man who gives fabulous oral histories on uh, star pack telemedicine. Okay, fast forward now. So now we've talked about telemedicine as we saw it in Arizona in uh, the uh, mid-1970s. Fast forward 20 years. Here, very little has happened. There's some work in teleradiology, some work in telepathology, but basically the world had gone black. And then uh, a number of uh, organizations in the United States began to think about it again. So we had our next spring uh, after 20 years. Um, so in the western part of the United States, our Western Governors Association, an uh, association of governors of 15 Western states, uh, uh, put out a report on barriers to telemedicine, recognizing it had potential value. Uh, the state of Arizona decided, uh, under the leadership of, uh, of a state representative, who you can see in the uh, back row, the fellow wearing the sunglasses, Representative 
uh, Robert Burns, that we should uh, fund a program and uh, basically a three-year program to see if, if it would take root. Uh, so it's called the Arizona Telemedicine Program, still called the Arizona Telemedicine Program. Uh, a couple of elements that went into this program that were important. One of our early uh, focuses of attention was creating a governance structure that would be appropriate for a telemedicine program. And this was, uh, I, I viewed this as a very major issue at the time, and it turned out that the solution that we came up with was successful for Arizona. And uh, for those of you who are interested in governance, it's called a non-statutory overarching authority. And you can get a copy of this PowerPoint and check out just what that means. But this is a, gr a group that meets quarterly on our state capitol campus. We met last week and really has given a form of governance that's very applicable to industries that are in cyberspace. Uh, our capable engineers have developed an infrastructure, so we actually operate a broadband telecommunication infrastructure that extends to about 160 sites in 70 communities. Uh, a number of many healthcare organizations have utilized uh, our network, so this is really a statewide enterprise supported by the state. Um, and many, many different uh, constituents, including uh, uh, Indian sites and prisons and jails and community health centers and schools and uh, even international sites. Group picture from uh, at the time of the organization, but you can see the cultural diversity that exists uh, within our program. And I think that's one of the great strengths of this program. We run, a, we run training programs on a very regular basis. We've had over a thousand uh, healthcare workers go through our training programs through the years. So we regard these as critically important to success. Another one of our graduating classes. Okay, I want to talk about clinical applications for the rest of my time. And there's kind of two broad categories. What works? That is from a medical point of view works, clinical applications that actually succeed in, develop, in, in, in delivering services. And uh, this would be a very, very long list, a very, very long list of applications, some of which are, are, are summarized on this slide. Uh, Dr. Anna Marie Lopez is in the center there, who's our medical director. And so it's a long list of applications, and the actual list of applications is at least five times this number of applications that, uh, that work and that work well. But very few of them uh, actually are used um, on a regular basis. Many of them are used in one or two sites or a small cluster of sites, but they don't necessarily take root and become mainstream within the healthcare industry. So I sort of want to differentiate between those things that work but aren't widely used versus those applications that are beginning to become mainstream uh, within medicine. So uh, one thing that's mainstream, of course, is uh, teleradiology. Teleradiology research actually uh, began at the University of Arizona in 1973. And uh, to date, uh, uh, the number of cases that have gone over our network exceeds 1.3 million cases. And that's been commercialized in the United States. So today, at the time we started this, there were very, very few sites doing teleradiology. That would have been around 1994, I think, that we did our, our first cases, even before we started our program. But today there are big, big companies that do teleradiology. It's argued that about 85% of the hospitals in the United States use some form of teleradiology. Uh, so 85% of about 5,500 hospitals are doing teleradiology. So that's become, uh, that's become a mainstay within, within healthcare. Telepsychiatry is a solid application. Uh, it's worked particularly in areas that have uh, geographic separations. So, for example, because Arizona is such a large state, we have many, many uh, patients who are out in rural areas who would have difficulty getting to mental health services. So there are uh, probably a hundred different sites that have done telepsychiatry over the years. Um, teledermatology is an obvious application. You know, looking at teledermatology at first pass, you would probably say, well, that's natural. That would go mainstream. Maybe so, but not in the United States. In the United States, most dermatologists don't want to do teledermatology. Uh, they, they're interested in case and looking at cases where they actually can do follow-up. They're interested in doing cases where they can take biopsies. They're interested in cosmetic radiology, uh, dermatology. 
so they can be more beautiful. But at the end of the day, there really are very few practices that are doing teledermatology, even though it works and brings great value to the practice of medicine. So issues there, S sounds straightforward, but it's complex. Uh, telepathology, start, stop, start, stop. Uh, there are sites in the United States that have been doing uh, telepathology for uh, 20 years, uh, but certainly the total number of sites in the United States remains small, despite the fact that over $250 million has now been invested in telepathology companies. Uh, we, suspe we, we suspect that that's going to take out off in the next few years, but we've been saying that for 25 years. So we'll see when that actually happens. Infectious disease is a very uh, interesting area because uh, as many of you know, uh, if you have access to infectious disease specialists, uh, efficiency and effectiveness of care can skyrocket. And uh, our experience in the United States is once you get about 20 miles outside of a city that uh, has an infectious disease specimen, your risk uh, for infectious disease progression goes up very, very steeply. So uh, we do a lot of uh, we we do a lot of work over our network in hepatitis C. There's quite a bit of work that's going out in relation to AIDS. Uh, there there is very sophisticated telemedicine provided by our institution into our jails and our prisons, but it's not necessarily a widespread application, although it should be. Telehome health is, a, is an entire uh, another industry, uh, home health monitoring, home health access to patients, uh, now, now wearable devices. All of these are of great interest and have uh, mobile health types of uh, industries and companies proliferating, and we'll see which ones are successful. Well, if you look in a broader sense to finish up, you know, what increases the odds for success in telemedicine. And I think there are, uh, looking broadly across the uh, thousands of programs that exist in the United States, uh, taking it as big data, what emerges are there are a couple of categories, three categories to think about when you want to talk about telemedicine succeeding on a large scale. That is more than a, a handful of, of, of institutions. First of all, there's gap service coverage. So gap service coverage would be something like teleradiology. Teleradiology took hold because of the fact that radiology services could be brought for night coverage at rural sites. So that's where it took place because nobody else wanted to do it. And then it began to enlarge in rural communities and then began to back diffuse into rural, uh, urban communities. But gap service, so instances where you need services and you absolutely cannot get coverage any other way. And uh, so we had a major distribution of radiology problem in the United States 20 years ago, which has been largely solved through teleradiology. Now, has that improved uh, uh, services or has that improved the care of medicine? Um, have outcome studies been done to actually show that it makes a major difference? And I would say, no, no, not really. We sense its importance. And because it seems so important, it clearly will continue to exist. But frankly, we're still waiting for the studies that uh, show that there's actually a benefit to teleradiology, although many of us can think of dozens of anecdotal cases in which it's made a large difference. Urgent services would be category number two, urgent services. And the two I would uh, uh, highlight would be telestroke and teletrauma. Uh, telestroke is probably going to be what we would call in the United States the quote unquote killer application because of the fact that uh, patients who are more than an hour away from healthcare who have evolving strokes can avoid developing the full stroke by being treated by clot-busting drugs, uh, particularly TPA. And uh, so it's now been shown uh, in a number of networks in the United States that if you can very early identify a patient who's just beginning to develop a stroke, and can treat them with intravenous clot-busting drugs, you can avoid that stroke. So for example, in Arizona, the uh, Mayo Clinic, the uh, Phoenix Scottsdale branch of the Mayo Clinic, started a program about five years ago, and today links to uh, close to 20 of our rural hospitals, and literally has avoided strokes in, um, in probably now in thousands of patients. 
And that's becoming a standard of care in the United States. And that's going to actually back diffuse into our urban communities because it's so successful. So basically for telestroke, there are two components. Number one, evaluation of a CT scan of the brain. And number two, to do an NIH, uh, an NIH uh, protocol physical examination, which can be done remotely by video. And uh, in fact, the people at the Mayo Clinic have uh, shown and published that you can actually render those two services, the identification of an incipient stroke on a CT scan and carry out the physical examination of the patient using a smartphone. And that's a real breakthrough because you, it really says that that vascular neurologist who's rendering that diagnosis can be almost anywhere to do that. So that's very important and a real breakthrough, something that you really want to check on. Teletrauma is a wonderful service. The problem is that it doesn't fit nicely into the practice, into the distribution of patients, into the healthcare systems as it exists in the United States. So although there are uh, uh, wonderful examples of success stories of teletrauma, telepresence in the United States, it certainly uh, is at its early stage in development. We're hopeful that it will expand, but it's, uh, again, in the category, but it works very well. Uh, it could increase the odds for success in certain healthcare systems, but doesn't uh, proliferate nearly as naturally as telestroke might. And then there are mandated services. In the United States, prisoners have a constitutional right to get, uh, to get, uh, tele to get services within the prison, very, very controversial in many areas in the United States. But nevertheless, our, our Supreme Court has said that not to give prisoners health care services uh, is cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, so there are some prison systems, particularly the large prison systems in Texas, that have been doing a great deal of telemedicine for many years. For example, in, in Texas alone, there are 240,000 prisoners who are receiving their health care services by telemedicine. And it's a very, very impressive success story. Why do we have a high failure rate for telemedicine programs? Frankly, if you look across the United States at the number of telemedicine programs that have started but not actually have failed, you would find out that over 95% of programs fail. For example, in one state, there have been hundreds of grants given for new telemedicine programs, of which uh, I think 97% of the programs have no, no longer existed five years into it. So, there's a very, very high failure rate, and it's very important to look at that. Now, that's balanced by other settings in which a great amount of telemedicine taking place. For example, in our Department of Veterans Affairs this past year, uh, there were 690,000 patients treated by telemedicine, and it's projected next year that's going to be 1.2 million. So that's recent data that's been published. But on the other hand, many, many small programs have failed. So let's just briefly touch on why those failures take place. First of all, a lot of the projects are demonstration projects. Somebody says, you, let's, here's some money for equipment. Let's buy some equipment and uh, see what happens and set up a program and um, you know, runs for a little while and then it runs, it runs out of resources and it disappears. So the, the only people who benefit from that are the people who, who actually manufacture the equipment. Uh, and one is left with telemedicine equipment collecting dust. Another is programs that start are, are start with startup funds. So you know the hospital uh, CEO says, "Hey, let's do a telemedicine program. Uh, here, here's fifty thousand dollars," and things start up, but there's no real business plan, and therefore those programs inevitably fail. Weak business plans. If uh, there is not a sustainability plan right at the beginning, a plan that shows how the program is going to be financed uh, one, three, five, and 10 years out into the future, uh, the program will fail. Uh, you actually have to know that. You can't say, well, once it's up and running, people will come. Uh, maybe there are a few examples of that, but they're very, very rare. And then specialty disincentives. And I mentioned dermatology before and the reluctance of dermatologists to actually do teledermatology because it really just doesn't fit into their practice models. And uh, the reimbursement is, is, is insufficient, and there are, are not ways to pay for the infrastructure and for the equipment. And then there was one, a last slide. The um, telemedicine is hard to do. 
Uh, it's not to be taken on by the lighthearted. Uh, I was a, a department chair for 32 years of pathology departments at uh, U.S. universities. And uh, I can tell you, running a telemedicine program is certainly more complex than running a pathology department. So I've, I've run departments that have, you know, 400 technicians, easier than running a telemedicine program. The issues are fewer in number. Collaborator mismatches. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, there are often mismatches between the outcome expectations of the users of the services and the outcome expectations of the people who are providing the services. Unless, unless there's a, a match between those two elements, the program's very, very likely to fail. And what we're finding in the United States is that the real success stories in telemedicine are frequently, if not almost always, in our large integrated healthcare systems, systems like our Kaiser system on in a number of parts of the country where there's a complete integration of the insurance products with the service provider projects. So uh, those programs tend to work, but if you have a lot of unrelated institutions feeding into a university program, uh, that's, that's, that's difficult to make success. And then program champions, it, it takes strong, strong, strong spokespeople for, for telemedicine programs. It takes strong pro, program champions. There are very few examples of telemedicine programs in the United States that have survived the departure of a champion. And that's, that's something one has to deal with very early on and plan for that succession down the road. Finally, uh, sustainability really uh, comes down to uh, are there key partnerships in place. In Arizona, we're very fortunate, very fortunate because state uh, initially representative and then state Senator Bob Burns really had the idea that uh, telemedicine would be good for Arizona. And he's been a, a remarkable success story in that he has now stuck with that idea for uh, for 20 years. And the fact that the fact that he's an extremely uh, powerful politician who has a real judgment and has picked this as his main project uh, undoubtedly is is the major reason for the success of our program. And I think it's hard to find a Senator Bob Burns, but on the other hand. One should be looking for a, a high visibility governmental leader who is willing to uh, be the face of the program and uh, provide strong uh, leadership over the years. It isn't going to take place because there's a physician who's interested. You can see one of those to the left. That's nice, but that's not the reason for success. The reason for success is partnering with, with people who actually can be strong advocates and be the face of a program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity. I ask Yvette to come up and say, ex express my great pleasure in uh, meeting you today. This has to be done in Spanish. Whenever I'm in, whenever I'm in Panama, people say, gosh, we wish he could speak Spanish. So I bought the Rosetta books and I studied them. And uh, gosh, you have a beautiful sounding language, but I just may be too far in my life to actually but I have the good sense to bring people into our program who speak Spanish well, so I'll let her represent me in thanking you. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Y el doctor Weinstein está muy agradecido por esa oportunidad otra vez. Y muchas gracias por, por eh, esta invitación. Okay, you're, you're talking in Lima, Peru. That's pretty sad. Let's wait goodbye. Bye. That's universal. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Thank you.